so yeah, uh, I'm Bart. Uh, thank you for choosing my session. It was probably a very difficult choice, uh, but hopefully uh, it's going to be very valuable for you. Uh, I'm going to talk about test impact analysis. So this is a technique that uh, we recently adopted uh, in my project. Uh, before I start, just a trigger warning. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to discuss microservices. Uh, uh, test impact analysis works well for monolithic applications. Probably if you work with microservices, you don't have those kind of problems that we have with monoliths. And probably you, don't even t you wouldn't even bother like, looking for uh, techniques like uh, test impact analysis. So if you work with microservices, this is probably not the talk for you. But maybe in the future you will work with uh, monoliths, or maybe your microservice will become monolith at what point of time. So you will get back to uh, test impact analysis uh, in order to solve some problems. So what kind of problem uh, test impact analysis helps you solve? So who of you knows what this uh, uh, mythical structure uh, represents in software development? Anyone? Have you ever heard about test pyramid? Yeah. So I thought that uh, when you have like uh, uh, tests that are shaped in a form of pyramid, everything is going to uh, just work well. And we do have like different types of tests on different level. And we tend to have uh, more unit tests than integration tests and more uh, integration tests than system tests or end-to-end -end tests. When you look at the numbers, we have around 70,000 unit tests, 10,000 integration tests, and about 2,000 uh, system level tests. So the pyramid is there, right? Like when you look at the numbers, we, we definitely have a pyramid. But if you look at the execution times, uh, the story is a bit different. Uh, so here you see like a relation between execution time of a single test. So you have system, integration, and unit uh, tests, right? Uh, there is something here on the unit level, you just don't see it because like, the difference is so huge uh, that you need to zoom in and compare integration uh, tests with unit tests, right? So uh, there is d d definitely uh, a big difference in execution times uh, between different types of tests. So if you consider like execution times of those different tests, uh, then you will find out that uh, you don't necessarily have uh, like a pyramid, you may have a con. Uh, so this is just by changing perspective how you look at your tests. And we definitely uh, used to have, and probably still have, a con, uh, because we uh, tend to spend 30 minutes executing, executing in sequence all our unit tests. We need to have like 600 minutes to execute in sequence all our integration tests, and we need two times more or even more than two times uh, to execute all our system level tests in a sequence. So when do we run our all our tests. Uh, so, like probably in all of your pro projects and uh, teams, you run your tests uh, against uh, master whenever something changes to on master, right? Like you are you are committing to master, uh, merging something, and you run all uh, all your tests. If you want to run all the tests that we have, uh, we would need to spend like 2,000 minutes, right? If we if we run them in sequence. But of course, we are not doing that. We are running them in parallel. So we are having like different uh, jobs for different types of tests. Uh, but we still need like uh, uh, 1,300 minutes to run all of them, because basically 1,300 minutes uh, we spent running system level tests, right? So it's always going to be the worst of those three. So you could say that uh, why don't you like uh, run those system tests in batches? So distribute your tests across like multiple agents and run uh, your tests against those agents. And we are we are doing that. Like we are running system level tests against like 40 uh, agents. And it still means that we are spending 45 minutes every time we want to run all our tests, right? Every time something changes on master, we are uh, spending 45 minutes uh, running tests. And this is just a story for a master. Uh, but because we uh, work in feature branch development, so every time someone wants to uh, implement something, uh, they are branching from master, starting their own uh, feature branch. This is just a remote feature branch. Uh, every time uh, we, wa they, they, we want to like merge our feature branch to master, we are going through this uh, test execution cycle. But on, not only then, but also whenever something changes on the feature branch, right? So if you are a like, developer and working on a feature branch, you are committing to, to that feature branch, pushing your changes to, to origin, and then like uh, CI picks, uh, picks those changes and run all, runs all the tests. So basically, uh, we are running those 45-minute cycles uh, at least two, three times for feature branches, 
and always where we uh, merge uh, changes from feature branches to the main line. Uh, yeah, running those tests doesn't only mean that we are spending time uh, and basically like we are delaying the feedback that we can get from uh, those tests, but we are also like uh, spending a lot of money uh, on those test agents where we run our tests. Uh, so this is also uh, costing us quite a lot. And this is a story for a single developer. So now, uh, multiply everything that I told you uh, times the number of developers that we have uh, working on, 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 on our product. And to just to show you what's the scale, uh, every day uh, we create around 70 pull requests and those 70 pull requests got merged uh, into master. Uh, this basically gives uh, about uh, 15,000 15, test agents. Like every single day we are running 15,000 test agents. Those 15,000 test agents execute uh, millions of tests and spend, uh, uh, I, I don't know how much time running those tests. So yeah, so definitely uh, just having a pyramid uh, shaped uh, a test uh, does, does not necessarily help you. So what might be the solution? Uh, okay, so there is a like, couple of solutions. Like, uh, let me just start with the long-term solutions. So maybe we should like flatten our pyramid. Maybe uh, we should like have less end-to-end -end tests and less integration tests, but instead have more unit tests. And maybe instead of having like a pyramid, we should really have like test pin. So have a lot, a lot, a lot more unit tests than other uh, types of tests. And we are doing something about that. We are introducing new types of tests. Uh, we call them component tests and DB unit tests. Uh, when it comes to DB unit tests, we are basically just testing the layer of our application that is responsible to talking to database. So we're just uh, making sure that Java translates well to SQL. Uh, and when it comes to component tests, uh, instead of like uh, spawning whole application when we run integration tests, we are slicing application into several areas and testing those slices, and we call those slices components. So this is not unit test because it, uh, it, it includes like multiple units classes uh, that work together in order to achieve some uh, business goal. But still, like, uh, it's a long-term solution. We will need to catch up with the, with the tests that we have. So right now, we don't have the numbers that we have for integration tests and system level tests. We have around 1,000 component tests at, the, at this moment and 5,000 DB unit tests, and it's going to probably take us a while uh, to refactor all the tests that we already have into component and DB unit tests. So what are the other solutions? Uh, the other solution would be to take this uh, big uh, pyramid and uh, split it into multiple uh, smaller pyramids, right? So this is basically like big architectural change to take your monolith and split it into microservices. And, we, and for every single microservice, have like a, a unit uh, integration and system level tests, uh, and have like separate uh, pipelines that run run those tests. And we are also doing that, but it's gonna probably take like ex next uh, two years to completely break the monolith and our pipeline into multiple m microservices and dedicated pipelines. So yes, and we need to, uh, and we need to help uh, our developers right away, uh, like how we can. Uh, shorten uh, execution times uh, with, uh, without like uh, need to wait two years or something like that. So before I talk a bit about like the uh, short-term solution, which is uh, test impact analysis, let me tell you a bit about me. Uh, so I'm currently a product engineer, but I used to be a quality coach, a like quality assistant. Uh, basically, like most of my uh, career is uh, around uh, quality assurance. Uh, I feel very comfortable in backend. Uh, I'm currently very interested in chaos engineering, and I really love coffee. Uh, but a bit, like a year, two years ago, I was looking into how good our tests are. So we know that we have a lot of tests, but I was like uh, checking how good they are. Like probably you heard that uh, coverage really doesn't tell you much when it comes to how good your tests are. Uh, so I was like trying to understand. Uh, whether the numbers of tests that we have bring any kind of value and maybe we are missing something. So uh, basically was look, uh, just doing those kind of visualizations, like this is, this is basically our application uh, divided into uh, different packages. So every single s uh, rectangle that you have here has a different color because this is like a different uh, package. And every single package is like uh, some kind of coverage and some kind of uh, coverage is missing. So I was like looking into that, and I was also looking uh, into understanding like what really happens, like what kind of code is executed every time 
uh, user does something in our application, like what are the different layers that, uh, that are called, what are the different classes and methods, in order to com c combine all of those data into like uh, this kind of stuff, which basically tells you like what are the most risky parts of your application. I'm not gonna uh, discuss this uh, as part of this uh, presentation, uh, but there is a present. Uh, there, I mean, there is a video that basically uh, where I basically talk about that. It's very cool uh, stuff. Uh, but when I was doing that, when I was looking into our call coverage, uh, I, st I, 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 I did several reports with uh, a tool called Clover. So Clover helps you generate uh, code coverage uh, uh, report, uh, which what is really cool about Clover is that uh, you can get very detailed information. Like you can go for to a particular line of code, uh, select that line, and see all the tests that go through that particular line. And you are not limited only to unit tests, but you can also see tests that are executed from like different JVM from different process. So you can also see here uh, tests that uh, exercise uh, REST API, or you have like if you have like Selenium or WebDriver tests, you will probably also see uh, those kind of tests uh, here as well. So you know exactly what tests go through a particular line of code and uh, you are not limited only to unit tests. So when I was like, uh, under, like trying to understand whether we have good enough tests or not, uh, at some point I, did, I, I implemented this kind of database that was basically a relation between tests and the code that those tests are covering, right? Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I knew exactly what tests go through what particular line in uh, our code base. So now let's talk about the solution, like the test impact analysis. Because once you have uh, this kind of database that uh, shows you the link between tests to your production code, uh, you can simply ask, like, why not use that database to run only relevant tests, right? So basically, we know exactly what kind of files uh, changed uh, whenever uh, someone merges something to feature branch or whenever someone is mer something is merged to uh, master. Uh, because we use versioning control systems, uh, we have that information. And because we have the database, we can just simply uh, execute uh, SQL and ask the database to give me all the tests that I need to run, given that I only change like those three or two particular files. I don't, want I don't want to run all the tests, I just want to run the tests that go through these particular files that I changed. Right? So this is like easy. The problem is that if you ever used Clover, and uh, you are not like a small, medium application, uh, it takes a while Clover to generate uh, those kind of detailed reports because like, it needs to instrument uh, your whole application, you need to run all your tests against the instrumented application, and basically like uh, in our case, uh, it took me about like two, three days to generate like uh, this uh, uh, cumulative uh, report containing information for all the types of tests that we have. Uh, but uh, there is another tool uh, you can use to generate code coverage uh, report, right? And it's probably like uh, the most used one. Uh, if you are working in JVMs, uh, you probably heard about uh, Jacoco. Uh, the only problem with Jacoco is that it doesn't give you this kind of details that you need in order to create a database that will tell you, okay, for th those particular tests are executing those particular classes. Uh, methods or lines of code. Uh, it just like gives you like what kind of what 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 percentage of packages of classes or methods are covered with tests. But if you look closely into uh, Jacoco documentation, you will learn that uh, you can run Jacoco as a JVM agent. So basically, if you have your application and it's running, you can uh, you can attach uh, Jacoco to you to that application. And whenever and, and, and integrate with uh, that agent Jacoco uh, over TCP uh, protocol, so you can basically tell Jacoco to dump uh, coverage information that it currently has into exec files. And once you have those exec files, you can have uh, like you can inject your uh, class files and get uh, coverage information uh, in in CSV files. So basically, you can uh, orchestrate uh, Jacoco. Uh, with uh, TCP uh, in runtime, so you don't ha you, like uh, generating uh, those kind of HTML reports is not the only way you can you can get uh, coverage information. There is also this uh, uh, particular uh, way. So uh, how how did that help us? Like 
uh, yeah, so let's start with uh, master. Uh, we are like uh, every every once in a while uh, triggering master to run all our tests uh, that we have, like those uh, uh, 70,000 mm, plus uh, tests, uh, like unit tests, integration tests, and system level tests. Of course, we are running them in batches because otherwise we would need to wait uh, for like this whole thing to finish probably like two, three days. Uh, so we are still running everything in batches, but in every single batch, uh, what we are doing is we are uh, starting our application, uh, connecting Jacoco agent to that application, and whenever a test does something in an application, like Jacoco knows about that, like uh, it knows what kind of uh, part of the application was uh, uh, executed as part uh, of a test, like uh, what kind of code was uh, was called, and uh, we also use uh, a custom. Uh, rule like we use JUnit to run our tests, so we use a uh, like custom JUnit rule uh, to uh, talk to Jack, uh, Jacoco agent. So whenever like uh, a test uh, uh, starts or finishes, uh, this JUnit rule is just uh, talking to Jacoco and saying, "Okay, I'm starting a test. Uh, start uh, uh, like gathering information. What code is executed as part of this test? And when test is finishing." Uh, the rule is uh, telling Jacoco to dump the coverage data uh, that it gathered uh, for a particular test. And Jacoco, and at the end of that uh, kind of cycle, uh, generates uh, uh, dozens of uh, exec files, basically as many exec files as we are running tests in a single batch. So at the end, we are basically ending up with a lot of exec files. Uh, which basically uh, correspond to all the tests that we have because like every single uh, task that we run has its own exec file that contains uh, coverage information in binary uh, format. And we have uh, a library where we uh, push all the classes that we have uh, in our application. And this library is taking like the binary coverage, uh, all the classes, and uh, uh, like uh, uh, creating CSV files that contain uh, information about coverage uh, for every uh, particular test. Once we have those CSV files, uh, we can simply just push them into, into a service that we called Timmy. Uh, this is nothing more than uh, the database that I, that I shown you. Uh, the only difference is that it's just a, a database as a service. So this is the uh, why it's called Timmy is because uh, of uh, first three letters from test impact map. Uh, this is basically like the the map that tells you uh, what kind of code uh, is covered by a particular test, and we are keeping it as a service in the cloud. So now, whenever uh, someone decides to branch from master and start new feature branch. Whenever they merge something to uh, to that feature branch, make changes, uh, we are trying to understand like what changed, uh, like uh, has any kind of uh, Java files changed? Uh, uh, maybe some new tests were added or tests were changed. Uh, combine a, like a list of uh, things that changed, uh, send it to Timmy, so this uh, test impact map uh, as a service, and expect Timmy to return us. Uh, like the minimal subset of tests that need to be run uh, for a particular uh, commit. Uh, of course, if we see that uh, as part of uh, as part of commit, uh, like tests were added or tests were changed, changed, uh, we are also running those tests. So we are looking for production code that changed, uh, looking for tests for that production code, but also looking for tests that changed because we are also want to run uh, those tests uh, uh, during. Uh, uh, like the test uh, cycle. So this is basically how the test impact analysis uh, looks like uh, in our case. Okay, so you may ar uh, you may ask like, uh, does it really work? Like, uh, if you if you, you like, does the test impact analysis really work? So how how can you test that? Uh, so what we like what we did uh, in the in the first uh, month or two, uh, whenever someone uh, decided to uh, create a feature branch, uh, we were uh, doing a shadow feature branch uh, as well. And like uh, creating like an exact replica of that branch. Uh, and whenever like uh, some, some tests uh, were about to execute on the initial feature branch or the original feature branch, uh, we were trying to understand like what changed on the, on the feature branch, combine a list of files uh, that changed, and send that list of files to uh, the test impact map service. 
uh, in order to receive uh, tests or the minimal subset of tests uh, to run. The idea was that uh, if uh, there was a test uh, that broke on the, on the original branch, uh, hopefully that test was also ret re returned by, by Timmy, right? So uh, it will also be in the minimal subset of tests that Timmy told us to run. And uh, over like a period of month or two, uh, yeah, we confirmed that uh, in 100% of cases, whenever, whenever something broke on the original branch, uh, if, if this test also was returned by Timmy in the minimal subset of tests uh, that should have uh, been, been run. So once we get that uh, confidence, we, are st we, were st we started uh, running uh, uh, test impact uh, analysis uh, against uh, feature branches. Uh, the other uh, problem uh, or, th or the other challenge that we uh, had to face uh, is we, we had to confirm that uh, this approach works all the time. Like it's not only functional, uh, like we are returning the right test, but it also uh, like it's operational. So basically we started looking into uh, how this uh, TIMI, uh, this uh, test impact map service behaves. Like, uh, are we able to handle all the requests that are coming from different feature branches uh, from our CI system? Uh, like, are we, are we able to handle like 100% of them? Uh, how long it takes to uh, compute the minimal subset of tests that need to be executed? And uh, because we, 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 we set ourselves some kind of thresholds, uh, like some kind of uh, service level objectives. We wanted Timmy to return a minimal subset of uh, tests uh, within 500 milliseconds. Uh, so we definitely started looking into that and confirmed that uh, we don't have any kind of operational issues. Uh, and this required us also to, uh, to look into like low level metrics. Uh, I, I won't lie, it took us a while uh, to make the service uh, operational. Uh, it probably like took us uh, as uh, much to make it operational as it as it as it took us to like uh, implement it, like uh, like uh, implement those uh, custom JUnit rules, uh, implement the da database, etc. Uh, we spent quite a lot of time uh, just uh, polishing it and uh, make it operational. And we also have uh, uh, a tool that every single minute uh, like asks Timmy for a minimal subset of uh, tests, uh, and this is because we, we, we want it to be operational like 24 hours, uh, seven, seven days a week. Uh, so if someone comes to, to the office uh, in Monday, in Monday, on Monday in the morning, uh, we don't want them to like suffer uh, any kind of inconvenience because our uh, service stopped working over a weekend. We want them to get their minimal subset of tests uh, they need to run. Uh, and because of that, we have a system that continuously uh, checks uh, our service uh, in production, let's say. And fortunately, uh, we don't have any kind of incidents. So it's, uh, we prove, we've proven that it's operational. OK, uh, so what about uh, results? Like, uh, what kind of... Uh, 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 what kind of savings you can you can expect from uh, test impact analysis? Uh, so what you see here is a, a dashboard that we created uh, to just monitor how well uh, test impact analysis uh, or Timmy uh, does. Uh, at the top you have uh, the number of branches that uh, were using uh, test impact analysis. So this is uh, those are numbers for uh, one uh, one working week. Uh, so we have like uh, 339 branches, which is roughly like uh, 70 uh, branches or pull requests every day. And here uh, in the uh, bottom right corner, uh, you have how much uh, tests we were able to uh, save on average and how much time we were able to, to cut. So this basically we were able to cut 30% uh, on average uh, from our usual uh, test execution time. So instead of uh, spending uh, 45 minutes uh, running tests uh, uh, on feature branch branches, we are now spending only 30 minutes on average, right? So we cut uh, those extra 50 minutes. Uh, we are still running like the full set of tests uh, on master, uh, but still like uh, uh, if you have so many developers creating so many feature branches, like the if you if you start adding all the uh, 15 minutes that got saved, 
it's, it, it, it sums up to quite a big uh, number of uh, reduced uh, time. Uh, so if you like sum, uh, like sum all the minutes that we were able to cut, uh, the re return on investment was basically uh, achieved in the first month of uh, team running in, uh, in CI. Uh, so we spent about a month developing the service and making it operational. Uh, and uh, in the next month, we were basically like, uh, we, we, we started uh, getting return uh, on investment. Okay, uh, one thing that uh, you may have uh, spotted on the dashboard uh, is this uh, pie chart. Uh, it basically tells us uh, why, f in some cases, we decided to run all the tests. So instead of going with a uh, minimal subset of tests uh, returned from Timmy, uh, we decided to go like, uh, let's go with, uh, run and, uh, let's go uh, full blow, uh, let's, let's run all the tests. Uh, there are situations where uh, you change other files than just uh, like uh, Java class files, right? Like you, you probably uh, bump some kind of some kind of dependency, some kind of library, and you had to change way whether like a build uh, uh, file or pom XML if you are using Maven as we are. Uh, and in those kind of uh, situations, we are not really sure uh, what kind of tests to run because we don't have that. Uh, correlation between uh, changes in our POM files uh, with the tests that we have that cover, for instance, particular uh, dependency or particular library. So in those uh, kind of situations, you can basically take uh, uh, two paths. Like you can be very aggressive and risk taking and say, okay, we don't know what to run, so we are just gonna run uh, the minimal subset of tests. Or you can be uh, yeah, uh, it can be like r less. Uh, uh, you, can, you, you may not want to take the risk and say that okay, we don't really know what to run, so we are gonna run everything. And we basically have like those two strategies implemented. Uh, but at the time being, like we are going with the sa safe st strategy. So basically, whenever uh, POM XML files uh, change or any other uh, files that we can't. Uh, understand the like, relation uh, of tests to those files, uh, we, we, we are basically running all those tests. Uh, so uh, probably before you even start like considering uh, testing part analysis, uh, you need to do like those uh, four steps uh, for your code base. So if you are like uh, using Git uh, as your uh, versioning controller system. You can, for instance, take uh, uh, all the commits that happened to your code base for the past two weeks. Uh, you can see how often uh, in those commits uh, XML files uh, got changed or some other files that you don't have uh, cov coverage information uh, for. And then, like, uh, just uh, compute how uh, how often that situation happens and say that uh, if it happens like more than 30% of the times, or uh, if, if it happens more than 30% of, if it affects more than 30% of commits, maybe it's not good way. It's maybe it's not good idea to go with uh, testing per analysis because very likely you won't see uh, those kind of uh, uh, times. Uh, r reduced uh, on, on test execu uh, execution. Uh, one more thing that uh, we were looking into but decided to drop that idea. Uh, at the moment, the database that we have uh, contains only information uh, of uh, Java class uh, classes, right? So we, so we know exactly what tests to run whenever a particular Java class uh, uh, changes, uh, but uh, we work with web applications, so there are also uh, JS uh, files and HTML files. And unfortunately, we don't know exactly what kind of tests to run in wh whenever a JS or HTML file uh, changes. Uh, but uh, it, I mean, you, you could follow the same principle and uh, put uh, like some kind of uh, proxy uh, between your tests and the web application and have a way to orchestrate that, 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 that proxy. So whenever you run, for instance, any kind of Selenium test, and uh, you, you can tell the proxy to start capturing all the JS files and all the HTML files that are returned uh, from web application while you run the test. And uh, also when the, when, when, when the test is finished, uh, this orchestrator can talk to the proxy to say, okay, now 
uh, save that information to some kind of uh, database so we can later use it and decide what kind of test to run whenever particular JS file or HTML file uh, changes. Unfortunately, we've never uh, uh, implemented this kind of solution. Uh, it should work in theory, uh, but uh, what we did instead, we just like uh, completely decoupled uh, our front end with our back end. So we no longer require like our, our, our back end to run uh, all the front end tests. Uh, so we no longer have those kind of problems with uh, web driver types of uh, tests. Like we don't need to spend that much time running web driver tests. Okay, uh, so takeaways. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, definitely like uh, testing for analysis can help you uh, uh, resolve a problem like uh, running uh, or spending a lot of time running your, your tests uh, against like monolithic application. Uh, but it would be really nice to not have that problem in the first place, like uh, not have that many uh, integration and system level tests. And uh, I urge you uh, to uh, think how your application or how your service would behave uh, if you grew to those kind of numbers. Like if you if you had uh, more than hundred times hundred times more tests than you have today. Like, uh, how would that impact your pipeline? How much more time uh, you would need to spend running your tests? And what, what, what would you do? Like, how, how would you decide which, which kind of tests run and which kind of tests uh, don't run? Maybe uh, in order to avoid those kind of problems, you could impl implement some kind of uh, test budgets, right? And like, uh, for instance, say that uh, every single change uh, can only add, uh, I don't know, like, half a minute uh, to execution time. So if you're uh, like making a pull request and this, uh, as part of this pull request you're adding tests, uh, those tests need to execute uh, in uh, 500 milliseconds. If they do not, then probably there's, there is something wrong with uh, the types of tests that you implemented. And before, because you need to make your budget, maybe you need to uh, reorganize those tests and instead of implementing integration or system level tests, uh, implement uh, more unit uh, tests. Uh, yeah, I've shown you like very custom uh, solution uh, that uh, may not work uh, for you, uh, but uh, you probably don't need it. Like there is, there is already uh, test impact analysis implemented in tool like Clover. So if Clover uh, works for you, uh, if, it's, if you are like a small or medium uh, size code base, uh, you can use uh, testing pack analysis right away uh, with Clover. And the good thing about Clover is that it's uh, open source. So it used to be, uh, it used to be so sold by, by Atlassian. Now it's open source. You ca can get a uh, free license and you can use Clover uh, to understand uh, how your tests relate to code base and decide what uh, what kind of tests to run whenever something changes in your code base. And uh, yeah, one more thing, uh, least but uh, I mean, last thing, but not uh, the least important one: uh, treat your pipeline as production, right? Like uh, you want your pipeline to be fast, uh, not to be sluggish. So every single minute that you can cut down from your execution time uh, is at the end helping your uh, customers and users. Uh, because uh, let's say that something bad happens on production and you need to fix that thing uh, right away. Uh, the time it takes you to, to, to reach production with a fix uh, will be impacted by how, much, how many tests you have, uh, how, how much time you spend executing them. Uh, so like uh, implementing testing for analysis also helps you uh, reach uh, uh, customers with fixes uh, faster. And we, we want to be uh, continuous uh, delivery, continuous deployment, uh, uh, like a uh, team. Uh, so we definitely look into ways of cutting uh, uh, like the time it takes uh, to run a uh, change through the pipeline. Okay, uh, so that's uh, all. Uh, thank you. Uh, one more thing, like uh, if you enjoy uh, working on Atlassian uh, products, uh, and you don't, you don't want to move to Sydney, you can always go to, to Poland because we also work on those pro pro products. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you.